What if I told you that you had the power to change that? So she focused on the upside, right? right? She focused on what I could do to do something that was important to me and worked on the thread that she discovered by connecting with me as a person to be able to do that. When someone takes the time to find what speaks to us, change happens. I'm Rebecca Mutter, and this is Moments Move Us, a people-first podcast unlocking the power of meaningful moments by bringing you stories that inspire. Dr. Sharif Elnahal was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at a young age and, like many people, struggled to keep it under control until one special encounter with a unique nurse practitioner spun that narrative and changed his attitude towards his disease. She found out what was important to him, and she used that as a point of connection. That moment was a turning point. Dr. Elnahal is now president and CEO of University Hospital in Newark, New Jersey, a job he started at the beginning of the pandemic. In this episode, you'll hear how despite finding himself in a new leadership role during a time of chaos, he made a point to connect personally with as many staff members as he could. Along the way, you'll learn why truly caring about people is worth the investment. To start, Dr. Elnahal talks about the reality of working through COVID. And just as a warning, some of what he shares will be hard to hear and perhaps graphic. But it's worth it to listen and learn from his experiences. I'd love to take a minute to kick us off today to talk a little bit about the last year, which has obviously been filled with different challenges and tribulations in light of COVID. And you are a new CEO, so would love to hear a little bit about the last year for you and any sort of pivotal moments that helped shape your experience. It's hard to know where to start when I'm asked about this because of so much that has happened really over the last almost two years now, if you think about it, because we really started to prepare for the arrival of COVID back in January of 2020. And so we're almost at that two-year anniversary of COVID really existing, frankly. And it's the same time as it feels like a short amount of time. It's just when you reflect on it, so much has happened. I'll start by saying that clearly the most difficult time for us in an acute way was, you know, the months that span between early March and June of 2020, when we were filled with patients with the disease that we knew little about, with the disease that was killing patients sometimes within hours after they arrived. And of course, that's a you know, acutely very stressful time that we experience. But in a certain way, it also actually strengthened us as a team. The analogy that I like to make, because I used to treat patients with cancer, is a lot of patients when they're survivors tell you that some of the easier times for some folks was actually during treatment when they had their entire support structure with them along the way, people checking in multiple times a day, loved ones by their side, even if they were physically compromised and hurt by the treatment itself and, of course, the disease. The hardest time, actually, for many of them is right after treatment ends, when folks may forget that that support is still needed. And in certain ways, that analogy works for the what we experienced. So one piece of data that is interesting to me is that our patient experience scores were among the highest they've ever been as reflected in March through May of 2020. The level of appreciation the community showed us, the fact that police and firefighters from the county, from the city, and the business community, the religious leader community, we were seeing something. We had the Blue Angels fly above our hospital, just an incredible display of support. And so even though we were really uh, hit hard, and more importantly, the patients in the community were hit hard by a devastating issue, we then saw our patient experience scores drop to among the lowest they've ever been in the summer of that year, when I think the burnout was maximum. And when people were worried and wondering, whether it would happen again and whether they'd have the stamina to get through it. But in many ways, during that acute phase, we became a stronger team than ever before. And that solidarity, the fact that we all went through it together here, is something that still binds us together, but also something that's causing post-traumatic stress in a lot of people. And I just think it's important to make sure that the continuous support that we saw back then for our healthcare heroes continues into the future because there are a lot of stresses now. And in many ways, we're more stressed than we were back then. What are some tactics that you used 
to come in and help the team feel that they were valued. An important mentor for me once told me that change moves at the speed of trust. And I've always kept that mantra in my head through every leadership position I've had, because I knew that in order to get anything done, I would have to gain the trust of people who will actually do the work. There's no leader who will be able to move the needle on anything important by themselves. And anybody who claims that uh, doesn't have real leadership experience in my view, because without inspiration, without gaining the trust of everybody in the organization, and it's not just the front line, of course, it's the people you have to deputize to make sure that every part of the organization is rowing in the same direction. If you don't have trust among your staff writ large, and if they don't want you as an individual leader to be successful, which is another thing a different mentor told me, they have to be rooting for you in as much as they're rooting for the mission, because everybody knows that ultimately the leader either gets all the blame or most of the credit when things go well. That's not lost on people. And the thing is, it's your responsibility as a leader to transfer that support and transfer that credit back down into the organization. And so, you know, one thing I did during the acute surge and I continue to do now, and even before the pandemic, was personally introduce myself to people in as many parts of the organization as possible. I visited uh, nearly every unit of the hospital in my first eight months here before the pandemic really hit hard. And I made sure that everybody around me knew that I viewed my job as one that was primarily working for their success. Because if that didn't happen, then we wouldn't be able to make progress on anything. The one story I, I will never forget is just going on the mother baby unit uh, that we had, which we had to close to moms and babies and make room for COVID patients. And I actually saw a nurse that I met when my wife and I had our third child here in the weeks before COVID hit us very hard. And this was somebody who was excited, relatively new on the team, chipper, you know, really just excited to make an impact for the community. And when I saw her around 11 p.m. one night, when she had a list of patients with severe respiratory disease, certainly an area that she was rapidly trained on over the course of maybe two days, but something that she did not feel she was an expert in. And yet she had to be first to bat for these folks because we needed her to do that. There was nobody else. And if it wasn't her, you would have patients uncovered. And she knew that and she processed that we needed her. And I think she processed the appreciation intellectually, but without me being there, having that conversation with her and saying that to her directly and listening and allowing her to cry and crying with her, frankly, I don't think she really would have believed it. And I had a lot of moments like that with every type of staff that we have when we were stressed because everybody was on full tilt, including joining uh, my team when they had to carry out deceased bodies at volumes that we never saw before. And I put on all the PPE, the bubble suit that you need when you do something that risky to yourself, because these people were doing it every day, just to see what that experience was like. And the respect that we had, that our team had, I saw it myself, for every deceased body, despite so many that we were loading into these frozen trucks so that they could be brought with dignity to funeral homes. That was emblematic to me that unless you're there as a leader, unless you understand by being there, you will not gain the trust that you really need to get through a time like that. Wow, that is incredibly powerful. I think about you kind of going from your CEO role, then being on the sort of patient family side when you had your third child, and then being that same person sort of subsequently days later after the pandemic began, and that shift again. So how many sort of hats you had to wear in that. And it takes a lot to be able to kind of show humanity in each of those contexts. How do you do that? The formula for that is simpler than I think a lot of people think, because frankly, the easiest way to get trust in my view is to be yourself and be true to people about your own vulnerabilities. And it was interesting because as you mentioned, this was my first hospital CEO job, but I can tell you that no matter how much experience you had as a hospital CEO throughout this country and throughout the world, 
nobody was prepared for this. And so we were all going to have to take risks. We were all going to have to pursue things that we never had to even think about pursuing before. And in a way that put me at somewhat of an advantage because my natural tendency was to be upfront that I didn't know what was going to come the next day, but nor did anybody else. So there were certainly people in the organization when I came that sort of thought, hey, what is this guy about? Seems pretty young to me, seems a little bit inexperienced. But when you make that point, because you can, because we were facing that kind of situation, interestingly, that was a, I was able to level the playing field and gain a lot of trust and confidence quickly. But it's not just about being authentic and talking about yourself and how vulnerable you are or how confident you are, because there were times when I did feel more confident than others. But it's about actually responding and following through and being honest when you can't. And, you know, for me, that conversation was no more urgent than for PPE. So for PPE, I was on the phone, our supply chain team, multiple times a day at times, but certainly multiple times a week, making sure that we presented our case for being prioritized with these companies within the supply chain. And certainly with the state, because we ended up relying on the strategic national stockpile as a public hospital more than others. We didn't have the purchasing power, to put it bluntly to compete with some of these larger hospital systems. And I was just pretty frank with everybody about our unique challenges there, but the fact that we had a good relationship with the state and the federal government on this front still allowed us to get through it. But I couldn't promise people that they'd have the PPE they need the following week sometimes, and I had to admit that. And it was a really tough thing to admit because right across the Hudson, I saw pictures of the healthcare workers wearing trash bags instead of isolation gowns and having to reuse N95 masks way more than is appropriate. Thankfully, we didn't have to go there, but knowing that folks were aware of that risk and that I was forthright enough to communicate that risk, and I ironically allowed us to really, really build trust in the organization. That's interesting because I think everything you're talking about is just be you, right? Just be authentic. And it's a simple message, but I think it's actually pretty hard to execute. Are there any moments that you can think of sort of from your past that allowed you to have the confidence to be really yourself and to realize that that was okay? I think our culture sometimes permeates this notion that it's actually not okay to be your authentic true self. So how do you get the courage to do it? So in a way, I have the benefit of having been in leadership positions before where sort of the assumption up front when I got into those positions was that I probably didn't know what I was doing. And the reason I say that's a benefit is because it's something that I could quickly prove wrong when I did show my competencies and when I did bring my experience. But that realization up front that I simply could not do the job on my own in a comprehensive way allowed me to pick folks on the team that ultimately led the execution of what we were trying to do, who filled my vulnerabilities and gaps. Being honest with your team about vulnerabilities and gaps is okay when you express confidence and recruit the right team that fills those gaps. And so it's not enough to just be honest with people about what you don't know. You have to do something about it. And you are, by definition, empowered to do that when you're at the top of the organization or at the top of part of the organization with a really important mission. And so we recruited three new executive leadership team members here in the middle of the pandemic. And all of them had skills that I did not have. And so the Steve Jobs mantra here about recruiting and hiring people who can teach you and tell you what to do, that also stuck with me as well, because it's a way to demonstrate that you're humble enough to recognize that. And once you fill out the team with ultimately what as a team ends up being the most qualified team you can think of, that's only possible when you're honest with yourself about what you can't do and what you're less good at. If you are too afraid to admit that to yourself, by definition, you're going to be too afraid to admit that to your team and you're not going to recruit the right team because it's not just about replicating you on your team. It's just not going to work. You're already there. And you need a more comprehensive set of competencies to do the right thing 
for the people in the organization, but and very importantly for the people you're serving. When you identified people for those roles, what were you looking at sort of beyond the, the resume or beyond the skills? I think anybody you recruit has to have the same level of dedication to the mission and to the people you're serving. That is something that you can never compromise on. You know, the most talented people who just don't care won't get the job done. Or people who are off the charts with their competency on any given issue or set of issues, but don't serve anybody but themselves, that doesn't fit with me either. And it really shouldn't fit with any leader trying to recruit a good team. And the only way to get that is by personally interacting with people. And that's that means an interview, but also the way I like to do it is uh, to do so in an informal setting outside of work. Virtual interviews are tougher because it's hard to get the vibe of people, but I understand we've all had to do that in the interim. And of course, approaching references is important, but I've always tried to get references not only from people's bosses, but from people who report to them. Because if you don't get that end of things either, then you just will never get the full picture. And I have been surprised about how perfect a hire looked until you talk to folks that had to deal with that person and report to them. And so I think all those things can help. And sometimes you don't get it completely right. Uh, and unfortunately, you find that out later on. But the approach of assessing character and dedication to mission, in addition to hard experience and you know, know-how, that's been my approach. And, you know, I think a little bit about what you were sharing before about trust. And and I was thinking about some of the things that I've heard you speak on around health equity and how that might play in to trust. Can you share your heart around that? And maybe if you can, is there a story or a moment that kind of led you to realize that this was a place that you really wanted to make sure that you could sort of share your learnings with others? Yeah, there's a defining uh, moment in my life when I was in college while I was mentoring kids in a diabetes class. And for background, I have type 1 diabetes myself. I uh, grew up with it since I've been age 12, and I'm certainly not a well-controlled person with diabetes in the beginning. I was in and out of the hospital a lot. And it took one nurse practitioner who was able to come down to my level and understand and somehow have the intuition of what it's like to be a 12 year old and connect with me in a way that allowed me to trust her and it was this person who really taught me how to manage my diabetes and why it was important and connect management of my diabetes to things i cared about and among them was the health and well-being of my own mother who has just been devastated for years since i've been diagnosed she's a pediatrician herself and Part of it was that we couldn't get it together, despite the fact that she was a pediatrician. And so, you know, she was helpful, not in a way that guilt tripped me, but in a way that made me see what was important. And knowing that that was the ticket, it's something that actually really inspired me to become a clinician myself. And so I wanted to pay that experience forward. And I did that with teaching this diabetes class with one of the physicians in a local federally qualified health center in Baltimore when I was in college. And one kid that came up to me after one of the classes, actually the first class that I participated in and said, hey, listen, I'm really interested in improving. He was with his mom. Most of the kids there had a guardian with them or somebody who supported them. And they both came to me and said, hey, you know, do you have time for a couple sessions in private? I have a lot of questions. I mean, of course, I took him up on that and just found how much common ground I had with his experience and was able to rewind into my own life and figure out how hard it was and have perspective on that. And we worked together in a way that was similarly empathic. And we ended up getting his A1C down from, you know, over 13 to just above eight. And it was really, really impressive. But I can tell you that that wasn't enough. And the reason I know it wasn't enough was the fact that he passed away that fall and he didn't pass away from diabetes or a complication of diabetes. He passed away from street violence. He ended up getting shot on the streets of Baltimore 
and it's because he had gotten in with the wrong crowd and, and with gangs. And so my reaction to that was one of devastation. I blame myself for not probing enough into his life. But when you really broke down his life, you understood pretty easily that everything was stacked against him from birth in having a long lifespan. But that was a very telling experience for me up front on what social determinants mean and how the cards of social determinants are stacked against people of color in this country because of the history of racism and the history of discrimination against people of color, sometimes at the hand of the medical system itself, oftentimes, unfortunately. And so I think it's important that we talk about this from the standpoint of history and getting better, because I know there are a lot of public debates now on systemic racism and does it exist and is it insulting to certain groups of people or not? That's not how I view it at all. I view it as if you don't understand what's happening, there's no way you can correct these issues. And I view the gears of government and the gears of policy and the gears of management in many cases of anchor institutions like the one I run now here in Newark as major players that can turn the tide on social determinants, especially for people of color and people who are discriminated against routinely. And so you can't think of a place that has more of those issues than right here in Newark. And the fact is where the capital has gone historically, where the investment has gone since the racial riots of the 1960s has been outside of this community. And you have kids born every day into the zip codes that surround us that simply just have a very statistically lower likelihood of thriving. And economic thriving has everything to do with health. It's just the way it is. And so every position I've had in leadership since my education, I've always tried to view this from the lens of what can we do to give a hand up? And I think we have to take the political discussions out of this and understand that there are so many institutions that have the agency to change this. And the fact that I've had the privilege to do that in different roles has been something that I found to be a blessing. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Alnahal. There's no better fuel than thinking about someone who you cared for and what happened to that person as, and may their memory be a blessing, you know, as a driver for change. And I think it, it needs to be looked at from a policy and big picture perspective. And then I also think about the person who really, like, she didn't guilt trip you, but she did sort of send home the importance caring for yourself. And I'm just thinking about how do we have more people share moments like that on an individual basis? Because hopefully as millions of moments can add up to really make a difference while the policies are hopefully being changed and being worked on as well. You know, one thing that I remember from my interaction with her was sort of a simple set of questions where she asked me, how's your life at home these days? Are you worried about anyone? And of course I brought up my mother and she said, do you want to see her get better? Do you want to see her be happy? Because one of the things I told her was that she was unhappy. She was sad about my situation. And I said, of course I do. And of course I want to see my, my mother happy. I love her. And she said, what if I told you that you could do maybe two or three things and we could start with only one of those things this week. And then we can go to two things next week and then maybe add a thing the following week that would change that. What if I told you that you had the power to change that? So she focused on the upside, right? She focused on what I could do to do something that was important to me and worked on the thread that she discovered by connecting with me as a person to be able to do that. So one of the approaches I took with our employees when we mandated vaccination, and trust me, that was not a universally popular thing when we did it over the summer, was that I actually had lunches and dinners and breakfasts with people depending on their shifts who were hesitant to get the vaccine. We had already, of course, announced our intention to mandate it. So people came with questions, people came in anger, people came in frustration, and people came in fear to ask me about why I did this. And I invited it. And knowing how empowered our community is, they all showed up. And one thing I was able to do was employ the same tactic to say, 
how many people in this room have had somebody been affected by COVID or have died from COVID? Almost everybody in the room raised their hand. That makes sense in a community where COVID was hands down the number one cause of death in our community and in black and brown communities everywhere in 2020. And so the same tactic. What if I could tell you that simply just getting the shot, and by the way, how stressed are you right now resisting vaccination? Because most people will tell you that it's stressful to think about vaccination, be nervous about it, and you can tell them all of the evidence about how safe and effective it is in the world. But if they're still fearful, that's a stressful state. And so I said, what if I told you that when you get the shot, you'll forget about it and you won't have to think about this anymore. So that actually worked for many more people than I thought. And in most cases, more than half the folks in those sessions got the vaccine within the following week. And then they were able to forget about it and go back to their lives, and think about other things. So it requires you though, to care about people enough to spend the time to do it because it's time consuming. Connecting with people consumes a lot of time, but that investment is incomparable in terms of what you get in return. You can speak from a podium all you want. You can communicate through memos and edicts and emails, but you're not going to get to what moves people. And for so many, it's not just the data and being right that moves them. And we see that everywhere in this country now when it comes to hesitancy around vaccination. But if more people were to take this tack and certainly stop alienating people who are hesitant and blaming them, then I think we'd see a lot more progress. That is so true. And I think the other piece of it is that you actually listened to them and you wanted to know about their experience and maybe why they were hesitant. And I think a lot of it is about listening. And you've said this over and over here in this conversation, but it's not making assumptions about where somebody is coming from, but rather meeting them there, wherever they are, and being compassionately curious to understand more. One thing that I had to learn over time, because it wasn't initially intuitive to me, was the importance of not only doing that and showing that you care to people on the front line, but also modeling the behavior for every leader in the organization, which means having them in the room with you when you're doing these sessions and being sure not to undermine them and their leadership and their agency in the process, even if their leadership style at that time doesn't employ some of these tactics. And again, the best motivator for change is modeling behavior and showing people it works but also in turn caring about them and respecting them. And so if you have a dynamic where you're the only trusted person in the organization, but every layer of management in between is not trusted, that is unsustainable over time as well. And in fact, what's not talked about enough is the burnout and is the fatigue and the post-traumatic stress that exists with everyone from supervisors to closer to the front line to middle management to executives who have all the pressure on them in many cases when something goes wrong. And so being mindful of across the board, displaying your values of respect and gaining trust with the people who immediately report to you and everyone under them, that is also extremely important. And it's something that sometimes can be forgotten with even empathic, well-intentioned leaders. Absolutely. And one of the things that I think you've done a brilliant job with is empowering your leadership team. You talked about building your leadership team and then sort of representing their team members and having sort of this cascade of gratitude, authenticity, trust, and all these incredible sort of qualities that you emulate go through the entire organization, not just a one-stop shop at the CEO level. And you've done that really masterfully. Can you share a little bit, and I'm curious if there's a story or uh, an experience that you had with a leader where you really saw them sort of maybe for the first time in a new way? Part of what you do when you enter an organization is sort of feel people out and get a sense for how they fit in the team and what their values are and those first impressions can be really informative, but they can also be really wrong. And so one person on my executive team, I wasn't so sure about when I got here, 
but the degree to which I learned over time that his immediate reports were just so adamant about how much he cared for them was very telling to me. And in one situation, I had one of his direct reports come to me and say that she had a really tragic situation happen to her and her family. He decided to personally show up to her and her family and her home and ultimately uh, a funeral. And the words that he, he chose and the empathy he displayed for her as a person and the care he displayed for her as a person is something that she wanted to make sure I knew. And it's always telling when it's not the person telling you what they're good at in your organization, but others vouching for it. And it was something that he did, which he clearly didn't have to do, it wasn't part of his job description, but that was a very telling example to me. Another example, we had a situation with pretty heavy rains on one day when I first got here and uh, with somebody that I also was sort of saying, hey, you know, what's this person about? Clearly the person noticed that a patient was being rained on, just drenched. And I didn't know who that patient was, of course, but he had an umbrella and actually, no, he didn't have an umbrella, he had a jacket. And he decided to take off his jacket and walk with her maybe 400 feet from the parking lot to the door of the hospital, just getting completely drenched the whole time. And he didn't notice that I was seeing this, but he was doing it. And that small thing that saved this poor woman who was using a walker from potentially slipping and falling and finding out where she needed to go. He was a person who cares about this community, even if their sort of daily personality wouldn't make that obvious. And so I think these hidden qualities can be so informative. And often people who are just very articulate and sure of themselves can obscure some pretty, you know, bad things too. So it's really through action that you learn, like what people can bring to the table and what their values are. And how you observed sort of those quiet moments. And did that sort of change the way that you saw this person? And has it sort of changed the way that you've worked together? Absolutely. And I've gone to him with that story a lot and uh, just expressed my appreciation for it. But again, the kind of person he is, he doesn't allow me to broadcast that to the rest of the organization. So I think being open-minded, especially when you first arrive and sort of not letting these judgments necessarily dictate what happens is it's pretty important. Can you share a time when you felt seen in a way that you always wanted to be seen? I'll recount one of my experiences in Washington when I was a fellow, so just sort of a young person trying to get stuff done in a government agency that I'd never worked in before. I'd never lived in Washington. Was grateful to be working with a pretty high level government official in the VA. And he decided to invite me to a congressional briefing to staffers. And I did not know the agenda. It was sort of a last minute invite and came there and spoke at length about the work I was doing and said to the, all these staffers that he's our quote unquote secret weapon. And uh, I just thought that was a really funny and nice compliment that he didn't have to do. And the fact that he didn't tell me he was going to do that made it all the more special because I thought I was just going to be a fly on the wall in that room. Right. And so it's an experience I remember because I know how it made me feel and it reinforced what recognition can do for people. Recognition is often the most powerful currency in an organization. And I use that word currency very purposefully because it's not just about how much you're paid or your bonus or, and especially in government, you often don't have those levers to pull. But even in the private sector and even in nonprofits, like the one I run now, it is often recognition that makes or breaks the cohesion of a team and again, that transfer of credit from the person who happens to get it because of their position to the folks that are doing the work and frankly deserve more of the credit because they have done the work. That has to be a diligent thing that leaders do and do it all the time 
There is no doing that too much. That is something that will sustain the morale. And especially now as we're seeing the so-called great resignation, right? I personally don't think it's just the people who are paying the most that will be able to keep teams together, especially in healthcare. It is organizations with leaders who care. And the best way to show that you care is to, that you actually care. It's another one of my mentors said that to me. And it's something I'll always remember. So recognition is just a huge, huge piece of that. And it's your responsibility as a leader to focus on. And I love the story about you being the secret weapon and not knowing that that was going to be revealed. When I think about recognition, you know, what you're getting at too is that there are a lot of ways to recognize someone. And the way that you also have recognized your leader that you were sharing about earlier, that's someone that you recognized for lesser seen things. And that made a big impact. And it's often the lesser seen things and the quote unquote smaller things that you do for one individual or a group of individuals that in fact need to be called out. Because the fact is not everybody in an organization can ever claim credit for a profit and loss statement or something quote unquote at scale that they've done. The reality is progress and success in an organization is just a lot of small things being done right. And without recognizing those quote unquote small things when you see them, it's hard to model the right behavior and it's hard to achieve the so-called bigger things. All of these metrics around quality, around patient experience, around financial performance have everything to do with what the daily experiences of a patient or someone who you're trying to serve is. And that is not you doing it. It is people that you are meant to and have to inspire to do the right thing. Absolutely. And you know, I think so many times we hear people at the bedside when they're complimented or recognized, say, well, I'm just doing my job. It's like, well, yeah, but what you see as the mundane or the everyday is the exceptional for so many people. And it goes beyond the clinical care that you're giving. It's, it's when you loan somebody a, a charger whose phone is running out of battery so that they can call their wife after a surgery. It's that environmental services worker who sings to patients when he's cleaning the room. That, that experience goes so far beyond just the clinical care that's administered. I'm going to shift now to the last part of our show. And we're now going to take a beat so that our listeners can get to know a little bit more about you, Dr. Al Nahal, with some fun questions. So I'm going to start to answer them quickly. You don't need to think too much about them. And I think it's going to be enjoyable for, for all of us. So can you tell us something about yourself that less than 10% of your work family know about you? So my favorite music artist is Kanye West. I think he is the Mozart of our time in a lot of ways. So I think he is an absolute genius at what he does from a musical standpoint. But often what gets the attention is some of the funny things that he does outside of his, his music, right? And if you look at Mozart, which I'm also a big fan of Mozart, similar sort of goofball type of character who just created beautiful music and beautiful art and really reflected the times I think he he's the same way. And if my, a lot of my friends and, of course, my family know that I'm a huge fan of him. But I think most uh, people here do, do not at University Hospital. So you don't wear your Yeezys to the hospital? <laughs> I do not. I do not. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. If you could do anything else in your life as a career outside of healthcare, what would it be? Do I get to create a world where I'm good at that other thing? Correct. I would have loved to be a talented enough musician to do concerts and, and do that. I play guitar and bass and dabble in other instruments, and it's definitely a hobby of mine. But that's something I really would have loved to do. Because frankly, you're just in the business of making people happy. And I'm in a business that indirectly does that, but more, much more direct when you're talking about rock stars and what have you. I'm noticing the connection also to Kanye. Like, is this, you're, you're like, I would be the next Kanye is basically what you're saying. <laughs> right. In so many words. <laughs> All right. I see you, Dr. Elna. <laughs> <laughs> 
If um, I could grant you one wish to be exceptionally great at a skill, can't be music because you already said that one, what would it be? Any skill. I'd love to be a lot better at football. And I, it was a telling experience recently when I took a trip with some college friends and we decided to play football. So first of all, my age showed at that time. A lot of people think I'm a young guy, not when it comes to being on the football field and immediately feeling like you're injured when you catch a ball that's bulleted at you. But then even against the denominator of older dudes trying to play football, I just wish I was better at the game, frankly. All right, Dr. Allen Hall, was there anything else that you wanted to say? I think if I were to leave you with one thing, ultimately, healthcare institutions, we're sort of the center of gravity in terms of need in any community. And I think the perspective that we can offer as healthcare leaders, I mentioned that my emergency room is ground zero for the most despondent here. I think if you were to ask most people who run hospitals in urban communities, they'd say the same. And so my appeal has been that we have a voice, right? And we should be using that voice to talk about things that are outside the square lane of healthcare itself. We are often the quarterbacks for getting folks connected to social services and giving them the opportunity to thrive economically. And I know that it's not me or us that are going to solve food insecurity for our patients, but we can certainly be the quarterbacks that connect folks to the right people and diligently follow through on that. And I think if more of us did that, we could start really start to chip away at the social determinants we were talking about before. And we have a unique perspective and should be doing that more in my view. Are you using your voice to uplift others? Are you taking the time to really see someone when they're right in front of you? I'm Rebecca Metter. Thanks for listening to Moments Move Us. Remember, when you take the time to really connect with someone, your actions can move others in unexpected ways. Be sure to follow wherever you get your audio.